Good morning, everyone. Back, back to Rome today. Back to Rome, which was beginning to emerge as the world's or the ancient world's greatest superpower. An emergence that we're going to see had a profound impact on Roman architecture. And we'll also see that there were a number of men who affected uh, this superstardom for Rome. Uh, and there are men that I'm going to talk about and, and talk about with you today. These included Julius Caesar, Pompey the Great, Mark Antony, and Octavian Augustus, especially Octavian Augustus, Augustus, first emperor of Rome. And it's the reason that I've decided to call this lecture today, From Brick to Marble, Augustus Assembles Rome. You see on the left-hand side of the screen a portrait of Julius Caesar. It's a green diabase portrait of Caesar. It's now in Berlin. And I believe, actually, that it is a portrait that was commissioned by Cleopatra herself. Uh, she commissioned it for a building that she and Caesar were putting up in Alexandria called the Caesarium that honored Caesar. Uh, and you can see that he is represented as he was. It's a quite realistic portrait with the lines and wrinkles, uh, with his uh, receding hairline and so on, uh, accentuated in this portrait. On the right-hand side of the screen, we see an image of Pompey the Great, uh, a marble portrait that is now in the Niekarlsberg Glyptotech in Copenhagen, and a portrait that shows that Pompey the Great very much wanted to ally himself with Alexander the Great, because if you look at his very full head of hair, you can see that he wears it in the center, uh, pushed up in a kind of pompadour, uh, which is a reference to the same kind of upsweep that was worn by Alexander the Great. I want to uh, give you a few, I want to give you a little bit of information about Caesar, about his life, about some of his accomplishments, because these are going to have an impact on the architecture, on our discussion of the architecture that he commissioned <coughs> in Rome. We know that Caesar was elected consul in 59 BC. He then joined with Pompey the Great and with a man by the name of Crassus to form what is known as the First Triumvirate. The, uh, the result of that first triumvirate was in part that Caesar received uh, a consulship in Gaul. Uh, but w despite all good intentions, just a few years later, in 54 BC, the triumvirate fell apart. Difficult times uh, were the case in Rome between 53 and 50 BC. Uh, there were food shortages and riots in the city. Uh, and the Senate was very concerned that these uprisings would lead, lead to a takeover by the populace of the city. Pompey took charge. He took control of the Senate, and he restored order. And his reward for so doing is that the Senate was willing to work with him to try to overthrow his rival, that is Julius Caesar. Crassus, the other member of the triumvirate, had since died. But Caesar got the upper hand at the end of the day, and it was Caesar who defeated Pompey the Great at a very famous battle, the Battle of Pharsalus, uh, which took place in 48 BC. After the Battle of Pharsalus and his defeat by Julius Caesar, Pompey fled to Egypt where he was murdered. And in fact, the Egyptians slit Pompey's head, put it on a plate, and presented it to Caesar. Now, you'd think Caesar would have been happy about that. He wasn't, because although he was thrilled to have defeated Pompey the Great, uh, he, did not, he did not like seeing a, the head of a fellow Roman uh, delivered to him on a plate. Uh, Caesar, at that point, uh, despite his victory, what was foremost in his mind was his affair with Cleopatra. And he stayed uh, in Egypt with Cleopatra for a period of time. Uh, but in 45 BC, by 45 BC, he had returned to Rome. He was acclaimed dictator in that year, in 45. And after that, he pursued fiscal reforms for Rome. And also, he commissioned a number of very important public works. And that's where uh, Roman architecture, obviously, comes into play. Despite the fact that he initiated those reforms and built buildings and uh, you know, built up the, the city in interesting ways. 
Uh, the aristocrats in Rome considered Caesar a tyrant. They considered him a tyrant because they felt that the influence of Cleopatra had rubbed off too much on him and his ambitions were too mon monarchical. Uh, and the aristocrats uh, encouraged uh, his murder, and he was assassinated, as all of you know, by Cassius and Brutus in the year 44 B.C. on the Ides of March. Uh, and he was divinized by the Senate. He was made a god by the Senate in the year 42 B.C. In his biography of Julius Caesar, the, uh, the writer Suetonius, who was a uh, secretary and a biographer to the emperor Hadrian in the second century A.D., Suetonius wrote a biography of the Twelve Caesars, a very famous biography that many of you may know served as the basis for Robert Graves' uh, very well-known I, Claudius, uh, which also accentuates, again, the biographies of those first twelve Caesars. And although Caesar himself was dictator, not emperor, he is the first of the Caesars who is covered by Suetonius. And in Suetonius' biography of Julius Caesar, he tells us about some of these major architectural commissions that Caesar embarked on in Rome. And it's interesting to read about these because uh, we'll see that all of them see, seem to have been the best and the greatest. And I think one of the explanations for this is the time that Caesar spent in Alexandria, in Egypt, with Cleopatra. She wanted to show him the sights. And in fact, they went on a very famous barge trip together down the Nile, in which she showed him the pyramids and the sphinxes uh, that were there to be seen. And he was extremely impressed by what he saw in Egypt and decided uh, that one of the most important things that he could do, that he could contribute to posterity vis-a-vis -vis Rome, was to make Rome into a city that was the equal of Alexandria, that had similar uh, large-scale buildings and impressive monuments the way Alexandria did. So he came back to Rome. He undertook this major building project. Uh, and Suetonius tells us that he built, he wanted to build, he started to build a temple to Mars that Suetonius describes as the biggest in the world. Why? To compete with the buildings of Alexandria. A vast, not just a theater, a vast theater. Uh, Greek and Latin public libraries. We know, of course, that the greatest library in the, wor in the ancient world at this particular time was the library at Alexandria. So he wanted uh, libraries in Rome that could compete with the great library of Alexandria. And he was also particularly interested in engineering marvels. He uh, built, or he began to build, a highway from the Adriatic across the Apennines to the Tiber, and then, uh, most famously, a canal cut through the Isthmus of Corinth. That was, in large part, achieved. Uh, and one can still see that canal if one visits Corinth uh, in Greece today. So he had vast ambitions, but many of these ambitions were cut short by his assassination in 44 BC. He was not able to achieve architecturally all that he had hoped. One building that he was able to complete, or almost complete, uh, was a forum in Rome. The Forum Iulium, I-U-L-I-U-M, which is after his family name, Iulius. Uh, the Forum Iulium, or as we usually call it, the Forum of Julius Caesar in Rome, uh, was a building that he was able to begin in the year uh, 52 BC. And then it was, um, it was inaugurated in 46 BC, which is a couple of years before his assassination. It wasn't quite finished at the time of its inauguration, and it was left to Caesar's follower, Augustus, first emperor of Rome, to actually complete uh, some of the details of the forum. But for all intents and purposes, it was done by 46. I show you a Google Earth a, a aerial view of uh, the Roman Forum. As you see it here, we've looked at this before. The Roman Forum, the Colosseum, just for you to get your bearings, the Circus Maximus, the Palatine Hill, the Capitoline Hill, the Victor Emmanuel Monument here, Mussolini's Via dei Fori Imperiali here, the so-called Imperial Fora, of which Augustus's Forum, which we're also going to talk about today, is a part. The Forum of Caesar is very close to the Roman Forum. It's located just to the left here and above 
uh, the wedding cake of Victor Emmanuel. You see it here, and you can barely make out uh, the three columns that are still preserved from the temple uh, that was located inside this forum. So you can see it was adjacent to, and in fact all connected to, the Roman forum that uh, lay over here. So a forum, uh, and in that forum a temple, a temple to Venus, Venus Genetrix, G-E-N-E-T-R-I-X, Venus Genetrix, who was the divine ancestress of the Julian family. The Julian family traced its ancestry back to Venus via Aeneas, through Aeneas. Uh, so this was the very special patron goddess of not only Caesar himself, but of the Julian family. This is a plan of the Forum of Julius Caesar as it would have looked uh, when the building was inaugurated in 46 BC. And I think you can see here um, that it has uh, two major prototypes uh, that, it, that models that were being looked back at uh, when this was designed uh, beginning in 52. Uh, you can see that it is based heavily on earlier Roman Forum, Samnite slash Roman Forum design as we saw it in the city of Pompeii. Think of the Forum of Pompeii. Uh, but it also was based in part on a building that we have not looked at and which no longer survives, but we have information about, and that is that uh, Caesarium or Caesarium of Julius Caesar that he and Cleopatra put up in, in Alexandria, and we know enough about that building to know it too was an open rectangular space with colonnades around it and a temple as part of it. So this whole idea of temple in a rectangular complex, we see it in Alexandria contemporaneously, we see it earlier in Pompeii at the Forum of Pompeii. So a great open rectangular space, open to the sky, uh, with colonnades on either side. Uh, you can see on this side there are some additional chambers, and based on what those look like in plan, I am sure you can tell me what they are. Does anyone know? Think back to uh, what we saw in Pompeii that looked similar to this. What are these here? What? Stor stor storage, did you say? Or? Storage. Uh, not exactly storage, shops, tabernae. Remember the tabernae that we saw fronting the houses in Pompeii? These are a series of shops or tabernae opening off the left a colonnade of the, of the forum. And then on the sh one of the short sides, pushed up against the back wall, in fact in this case almost projecting out of the forum to a certain extent, the temple of Venus Genetrix. We can see in plan, and it dominates the space in front of it, just as the Capitolium did at Pompeii. Uh, we can see the general plan conforms to early Roman uh, temple architecture, as we've described it, with its use of the Etruscan plan and the Greek elevation. Uh, we can see that there is, it has a, uh, well, I'll show you this in a moment, but take my word, it has a high podium, it has a deep porch, it has freestanding columns in that porch. It has a facade orientation, although one idiosyncrasy of this particular uh, temple is that the staircase uh, is located not just on the front, but on the two sides, but only at the level of the podium. The staircase does not encircle the building as it would have in a Greek temple, uh, but it goes beyond the front to the sides of the podium uh, to allow access to it that way as well. A single entrance, because this is a temple of uh, Venus and not the cap and not the Capitoline Triad, and then columns, freestanding columns on either side, uh, and but a flat back wall, uh, very much in the Etruscan manner. So a temple that is very much in keeping with the other kind of temple architecture that we have seen thus far. What's significant, though, again, is that the choice of the choice of goddess to honor here. Uh, the fact that it is Venus Genetrix, a personal goddess from the point of view of Julius Caesar, someone who was, uh, who was uh, associated closely with his family, with the genesis of his family, and not with the Roman state as a whole. And that's a very important distinction, the difference between putting up a temple to the Capitoline Triad, a very state-oriented thing to do, to putting up a temple to your own personal goddess. Uh, it signals a certain change vis-a-vis uh, -vis the way these individuals thought about themselves, and 
uh, may, may again have had something to do with the way Caesar was perceived in Rome uh, and to his eventual demise. In fact, I should also add that Caesar, uh, because of his relationship with Cleopatra, ended up putting up a statue of Cleopatra as the Egyptian goddess Isis in this temple as well, standing right next to uh, Venus Genetrix, which was a pretty arrogant and probably a pretty stupid uh, thing uh, to do in Republican Rome, where, where, uh, where Cleopatra was uh, considered very, a very interesting public figure, because she did come with him to visit Rome at one point, uh, but was uh, also uh, maligned uh, by many among the aristocracy as an enemy of Rome. I'm showing you here a view of the Forum of Caesar as it looks today, and you can see uh, the columns on the left-hand side from the colonnade. Some of those still stand. Uh, you can see the uh, staircase or the foundations of the staircase and the podium, tall podium again, of the Temple of Venus Genetrix. But you can see that only a very small number, three in fact, of the columns are preserved. So it is an actually quite ruinous state. Uh, and what you're looking at here is actually not even, for the most part, the uh, Julian uh, building, because we know that this building was seriously damaged in a fire later, uh, and that it was restored by the Emperor Domitian in the late 1st century AD, and then by the Emperor Trajan into the early 2nd century AD. And so what stands today is primarily a later structure, but we do believe it was based very closely on the original Julian building, and in that regard is a very good reflection of what it would have looked like. This coin over here shows the temple as it was in the time of Julius Caesar. We see uh, the altar in the front, the altar because the sacrifice always takes place in front of a Roman temple. The temple itself with its columns that are parted on this coin only to show the statue of Venus Genetrix inside, the cult statue. Uh, the colonnades on either side, and then if you look closely at the pediment, you can see that there's sculpture in there, and we have literary descriptions of what that sculpture depicted, and we know it was a scene of Venus rising from the sea. So Venus Genetrix rising from the sea, the closest thing probably to it is something like, for, for those of you who know it, the uh, Botticelli's Primavera in Florence is probably the sort of the idea here for emerging from uh, the waters and in, in her depiction in this particular uh, pediment above. And we know that there were also scenes of cupids uh, carrying the arms and armor probably of Mars. Uh, this is me with a former graduate student of mine pointing out he wrote a dissertation on the Forum of Caesar, which was afterwards published as a book. Uh, but he, he's pointing out to me here some of the, uh, some of the architectural detail that still survives that one can see when one wanders through that forum today. And uh, you can see the very deep drill work here, deep drill work that is actually not characteristic of the time of Julius Caesar, but rather of the time of Domitian and Trajan. So probably this decoration belongs to the later uh, renovation of this particular structure. This gives you perhaps the best idea of what the temple would have looked like in the forum. Uh, a restored view of the Temple of Venus Genetrix in the Forum of Julius Caesar, with it, its inscription telling us that Caesar, a dictator of Rome, uh, put it up, fake it, uh, as you can see here. You can see the tall podium. Uh, you can see uh, the facade orientation, although, again, there was a staircase on uh, the three sides of that podium. Uh, you can see the birth of Venus in the pediment above. You can see the columns over here of the side, of the colonnade of, of one of the left side of the forum, which would have had statues on bases, the shops behind. Uh, and uh, most importantly, what this uh, restored view shows you is the relationship between the Temple of Venus Genetrix and Caesar's Forum and the Capitolium on the top of the Capitoline Hill. Because when you take away the Victor, Monument, uh, the Victor Emanuel Monument, which is there now and which we saw in the earlier image, uh, you can see that the building that was up on top of the hill at this particular time was, of course, the Capitolium, the Temple of Jupiter OMC. And I mentioned to you at the time we talked about the Temple of Jupiter OMC, although the Campidoglio, as redesigned by Michelangelo with the senatorial palace in the back, which is where the uh, Temple of Jupiter OMC was, faces modern Rome. 
the ancient temple faced ancient Rome, faced the Roman Forum. Uh, and so you see it facing the Roman Forum in this restored view. So I don't think it was coincidental. The Romans were very careful, as we've learned, about how they cited their buildings, and they liked to make references from one building to another. I don't think it is any coincidence that Ch Caesar chose this site for his Temple of Venus uh, so that anyone who gazed at it would also see, out of the corner of their eye, the temple of the Capitoline Triad on the Capitoline Hill, and that would only enhance Caesar's stature uh, in the eyes of his contemporaries. Uh, you see now portraits of Mark Antony on the right-hand side of the screen, a black basalt portrait of Antony now in England, and a portrait of Rome's first emperor, Octavian Augustus, on the left-hand side of the screen, a fantastic bronze image of him that was part of an equestrian statue found in the North Sea uh, near Greece. With regard to Antony and Octavian, after Caesar's assassination in 44 BC, it was Mark Antony who rose to power. Octavian was only 19 at the time, so your age, uh, and he was the grand nephew of Caesar. So he had a familial relationship, although a fairly distant one, to uh, Caesar, the grand nephew of Caesar. And this 19 year old upstart uh, tried to overthrow Mark Antony, and he was not successful. In the wise, if you can't beat them, join them way of thinking about life and the world, uh, Octavian joined with Antony, with Mark Antony, and a man by the name of Lepidus to form what we know of as the Second Triumvirate, and that happened in the year 43 BC. Once they had formed the, uh, the Second Triumvirate together, Octavian and Antony took all of their military forces, and each of them had a considerable amount, and they combined them <coughs> with the objective of going after Cassius and Brutus. Cassius and Brutus, who you'll remember, had murdered uh, Caesar. And they were successful at so doing. They, uh, they, be they, they beat and murdered uh, Cassius and, and Brutus at the Battle of Philippi in the year 42 BC, a very important battle, the Battle of Philippi in 42 BC. Uh, Mark Antony, uh, who not only um, uh, rose to power after Caesar's assassination, but rose uh, in the life and uh, times of Cleopatra. They had entered into, well, there's some rumors that this happened or began much earlier in time. But at any rate, Mark Antony uh, takes up with Cleopatra, and he joins her in, in Egypt, and he spends a good deal of his time in the eastern part of the empire with his paramour. Octavian very smartly realized Antony is distracted. This is a perfect time for me to try once again to uh, gain the supreme power that I want. I don't want to be part of a threesome. I want to rule Rome completely myself. Uh, and uh, he defeats Antony and Cleopatra at one of the most famous battles of all time, the Battle of Actium, a naval battle which took place off the northwestern coast of of uh, Greece in 31 BC. After that very famous battle, Antony and Cleopatra commit suicide, and Octavian becomes the sole emperor of this newly emerging superpower. Uh, and he is appointed as Augustus, which meant that he had a special kind of majesty in the year 27 <coughs> BC. We have additional information about Augustus from Suetonius' biography of him. Uh, he wrote one of him, obviously, as well. And from Augustus' own account of his uh, life uh, and of his accomplishments. I mentioned that Octavian, and that's called the Res Gestae Dewi Augusti. Uh, I mentioned that Octavian took the title of Augustus in 27 BC. And he was emperor of Rome for a very long time, from, uh, the, from that year 27 until his death in AD 14 at the age of 76, which was a very ripe old age to live to uh, at a time when most people, where women were dying in childbirth at 
10 to 20, and uh, men uh, were dying for the most part in their 30s. So 76 was a very old age indeed in ancient times, and it meant that Augustus was emperor of Rome for a very long period, uh, as you can see. Now at his death, uh, uh, Augustus deposited three documents besides his will uh, with the Vestal Virgins in Rome, and these included instructions for his funeral, a kind of State of the Union address, what was the situation in Rome and in the empire uh, at the time of his death or right before his death, and then most importantly for us, a resume of his acts, a resume of all of his accomplishments during his lifetime, which were meant to be carved on two bronze plaques that were to be set up in front of his tomb in Rome. These are the famous res gestae Dewi Augusti, uh, and that means the list of things accomplished of the divine Augustus, because Augustus, like Caesar before him, was made a god, was transformed into a god at his death. Uh, and this lists all of his accomplishments at home and abroad, the battles that he won, the cities that he formed, uh, but most important for us, it lists dozens and dozens of building projects. For example, it lists 82 temples that he either restored or built in Rome, in Rome itself. Uh, so it gives you some sense of the magnitude of this man's uh, building objectives uh, and, uh, and, uh, and is very important to us as a compendium of what he does. Some of these buildings still survive, some of them don't, but this is a very f informative list indeed, and it shows us that to Augustus, as to Caesar before him, the building of buildings uh, was extremely important, the making of buildings not only to remake Rome in the, uh, you know, as a great city of the ancient world, uh, but also to leave something for posterity, uh, and of course both of them were successful in both of those objectives. Very important for us today is also the words of Suetonius. Suetonius tells us that Augustus bragged that he, and I quote, found Rome a city of brick and left Rome a city of marble. A city of brick meaning that brick tile that we saw in Pompeii, he found a Rome that was built out of that same kind of brick tile that we saw of Pompeii, but he wanted to transform, he left the city of Rome uh, a city of marble, and that's exactly the major thrust of today's lecture. Augustus builds Rome, Augustus builds Rome as a marble city in the model of ancient Greece, in the model of Athens. Uh, in the Greek part of the world. It's a rhetorical exaggeration, but we're going to see from the two Augustan buildings that I show you today uh, that it wasn't far off the mark, uh, that he really did uh, create a city of marble on the Tiber, uh, and he left for posterity that Greek marble temple, a Hellenized, uh, a Greek marble city, a Hellenized uh, city that builds on the Hellenization of Roman architecture that we've already talked about. What made uh, Augustus's boast possible was the fact, for the first time in its history, uh, a high quality marble was available to Rome uh, a, 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 in, in close proximity, that is marble from Italy itself as opposed to imported marbles. We've seen up to this point that the Romans wanted to build marble buildings, that they, that they created uh, faux marble walls, the first style at Pompeii, for example, and also in Rome, uh, that they created temples uh, out with, with columns that, and uh, superstructures that were made out of tufa or, or travertine, and then they stuccoed those over white to make them look like marble, even though they were not marble. Uh, but that they just didn't have access to marble readily enough to transform, to actually make these buildings out of marble itself. There, are, there was some, some flirtation with it. They did import a certain amount of Greek marble to use uh, for some buildings, but <coughs> it wasn't available at a low enough cost to allow the kind of full-scale marble building uh, that they wanted to do. What happens in the end of the, of the uh, 
reign of Caesar and into, or the dictatorship of Caesar, and into the emperorship of Augustus, is that all of a sudden a high quality, relatively inexpensive marble becomes available. Because what happens is the Romans begin to exploit in the late Caesarian period and into the age of Augustus the marble quarries at Luna on the northwest coast of Italy. Uh, this is the same town as modern Carrara, the same quarries that were used centuries later by none other than Michelangelo himself. Carrara marble, you all know Carrara marble, called Luna, the, the site called Luna in ancient Roman times, so Luna or Carrara marble. I show you a view here of the uh, marble quarries, or one of the marble quarries at Luna slash Carrara, what it looks like today. This is a reenactment of bringing the marble blocks down from the mountain uh, for use in construction. They basically do it the same way today as they probably did it in ancient Roman times. Uh, and it was fairly easy to get this since it was on the coast. It was fairly easy to load this marble into boats, bring it down to Ostia, and then up the Tiber uh, to Rome. And that began to be done uh, in, in, in with great success especially in the age of Augustus. Going to Carrara today is a pleasure. It's an interesting place to visit, especially if you go there at the time of the, um, of the, uh, the marble e exhibition that they have and the competition that they have uh, where people uh, make uh, whatever out of, out of Carrara marble and compete for prizes. And I show you a view uh, taken during one of these, uh, one of these contests uh, here now on the screen. And there are some amazing, amazing uh, works of, of art, we might call them, that come out of these competitions. Here's one of my favorites. Uh, you see over here uh, the, mar the, the, the Luna marble version of a, an Italian Cinquecento. These Cinquecentos, which were minuscule, uh, are, not, um, are then m not many of them exist today, although you do see some antique versions here and there. But I had one of these once, and you can see a picture of me, in fact, here in front of American Express, not far from uh, the Spanish Steps, the Piazza di Spagna, with my Cinquecento. It's a long time ago. Uh, but you can see how small it is. I'm actually standing on the front, uh, front passenger side and uh, popping up through the sunroof. But use my size there, and I'm about 5'7", compared to the car, it gives you some sense of how small uh, these cars were today. So the Italians have been very good about, about this sort of thing for some time and continue, as you well know, to drive, for the most part, small cars uh, through the city. And another one of my favorite uh, entries into the competition are these Luna marble decapitated heads of Juan and Evita Peron uh, that were put forward uh, in one of these competitions some years ago. <coughs> With regard to transforming Rome into a marble city, now that Carrara marble was available at a fairly low uh, cost compared to the importation of Greek marbles, uh, Augustus begins to build his marble city. And I'm going to show you two major commissions uh, of Augustus today. Uh, the first of these uh, is the Forum of Augustus in Rome, a forum, uh, or the Forum Augustum in Rome, uh, that, that was uh, very much in Augustus's <coughs> mind uh, from the beginning of his rise to power. In fact, there, it's Suetonius who tells us uh, that the reason that Augustus built a forum in Rome was because even though there were already two forums in Rome, that includes the Roman Forum and the Forum of Julius Caesar, even though those two existed and were both being used, that the population, Suetonius tells us, the population was growing by leaps and bounds, as were the need to try judicial cases, and that the, uh, pla the spaces in the forums of uh, the Roman Forum and in the Forum of Julius Caesar did not allow uh, for the needs of the populace or for these, the needs of these judicial cases, and that they needed to build another forum. Well, that's a good story, but the likelihood is it had pr pretty much nothing to do with that. It may have had something to do with that, but not a lot to do with that, uh, because uh, Augustus had ulterior motives. Augustus, it was at the Battle of Philippi, that battle of 42 BC, when uh, Mark Antony and uh, Octavian joined forces to defeat the 
uh, assassins of Julius Caesar. It was at, right before that battle that Augustus vowed that if he won, if he were successful, uh, that he would build a temple to Mars the Avenger, Mars Ultor, U-L-T-O-R, Mars Ultor, Mars the Avenger, in gratitude for helping him avenge uh, the death of Julius Caesar, the murder of Julius Caesar, the assassination of Julius Caesar. And so when he was successful, he said, I will build uh, that temple, and that temple needed an environment. Uh, and uh, as we've seen, Romans often built temples inside complexes, whether it was sanctuaries or forums. Uh, and so he had a good excuse uh, to build a major forum in Rome as a domicile uh, for the temple of Mars Ultor. He didn't get around to it for a while. Again, the Battle of Philippi 42, but he had a lot of other things to contend with, namely Mark Antony and Cleopatra. It wasn't until after the Battle of Actium, when he got rid of the two of them, uh, that he had time uh, to build this temple to Mars Ultor, and we see it beginning to go up in 28 BC, so considerably later than the original battle, 28 BC, and it was dedicated in Rome in a very on a very important date, the date of, a of AD, uh, of 2 BC, excuse me, of 2 BC. So uh, begun in 28 BC and dedicated in 2 BC, and that's the date that I've given you on the monument list, the dedication of the Temple of Mars Ultor and the Forum of Augustus in 2 BC. We see its plan here. We will see momentarily that it is, was built in very close approximation, in, in fact, right next to the Forum of Julius Caesar. Why? Because, of course, Augustus wanted to associate himself with his divine adoptive father, Caesar, so he puts his own forum right next to Caesar's. We see the Forum of Augustus here. We can see that it follows in the main the plan of the Forum of Julius Caesar. It is a rectangular space, open to the sky, uh, with colonnades on either side, with a temple in the center pushed up against the back wall and dominating the space in front of it. The only change here is the addition of these hemicycles, one on either side looking very much like the hemicycles that we looked at from the uh, sanctuary of Fortuna Primigenia at Palestrina, these embracing arms that serve to accentuate architecturally and visually the temple in the center, uh, and that also served as a place. There are niches on either side where they could put statuary and the like seen through the columns, as you can see here. The temple of Mars Ultor itself, again, very similar to temples, early Roman temples that we've been talking about, uh, using the Etruscan plan. Facade orientation, single staircase, deep porch, freestanding columns in that porch, freestanding columns on either side, but yet, like an Etruscan temple, a flat back wall, as you can see here, some columns inside decorating the cella of the temple, and then a single niche uh, for the cult statue uh, inside. And note here also uh, the base. Uh, I'll say something about the statue that stood, stood on that base later. Here's a Google Earth view of this part of Rome showing uh, the connection between, this is, you can see here, the uh, Forum of Julius Caesar as it looks today. This is the entrance. Uh, we're moving back toward the Capitoline Hill. These are those three columns that I showed you before are still preserved, as well as the columns of the colonnade on the left side that entered into uh, the shops. Here's the modern Via dei Fori Imperiali, uh, built by Mussolini. What Miss Mussolini did was slice uh, the Roman Forum and Julian Forum from the so-called Imperial Fora, to which they were originally attached. Uh, and any of you who have been in Rome recently know that this entire area is being excavated. The plan is, the street is still there now, but the plan is eventually, I, we'll see whether this really happens, because it's going to be a traffic nightmare, but the plan is to take that, that uh, Mussolini street down eventually and reunite all of these forums in some great archaeological park uh, someday. It would be exciting if that were to happen. So the modern street, but initially the Forum of Caesar would have stood exactly next to the Forum of Augustus. We see that here, and if you look carefully, you can see the remains of the Temple of Mars Ultor, as well as a precinct wall uh, that is preserved. It was a 115-foot precinct wall pr uh, protecting the Forum from just the area we were talking about before, that question about uh, housing for 
the well-to-do and the less well-to-do in ancient Rome, protecting the forum from the so-called subura, S-U-B-U-R-A, which was that area of Rome in which all of those rickety wooden tenement houses uh, were located and which were constantly going up in fires to protect the temple, because marble can burn, to protect the temple of Mars Ultor from uh, all of that uh, stuff uh, that was back there in the subura. Here's another view from Google Earth, from, taken from the other side, showing the remains of the temple of Mars Ultor pushed up against the back wall, and then that precinct wall that is very well preserved, snaking its way around, dividing the forum proper, the sacred space, from the residential area called the Sabora uh, that was behind. Here's a view of the, uh, uh, of the uh, precinct wall as it looks from the outside of the forum today. Uh, there are some additions that were made in later times, you know, medieval-looking windows and the like. Uh, but for the most part, it's preserved as it was. You can see we're dealing with ashlar blocks made out of peperino stone, P-E-P-E-R-I-N-O. We've talked about peperino before. It's a form of tufa, a stone that was used here with ashlar blocks for uh, the encircling precinct wall. You can see the coloration of those uh, peperino blocks, grayish-brownish color here. Uh, and you can see the difference between that and the temple, the remains of the temple, the columns, the steps of the temple, as well as some other decoration and also some of the walls were made out of Luna or Carrara marble, Luna or Carrara marble uh, for this <coughs> temple. This is a view of the temple of Mars Ultor as it looks today. It's in ruinous state, but enough is preserved for us to get a very good sense of what it originally looked like. You can see that the podium is tall. You can see that it's made out of tufa. Uh, you can see that the steps are sheathed in Carrara marble, uh, brought from uh, those quarries that we discussed before. You can see that the columns were also made out of solid Carrara marble. We see that here. We see a wall in Carrara marble, and we see the distinction between that and the Peperino walls. Uh, you can also see in this very good view a, uh, a, a, one of the hemicycles on the left-hand side, and you can see those niches that I mentioned before uh, that would have held statuary that you could see uh, through the columns. This is a restored view in the Ward Perkins uh, textbook, which shows you what uh, the temple would have looked like in uh, antiquity when it was in its uh, final form, and uh, you can see the, 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 everything we've described, the tall podium, single staircase, facade orientation. You can see also that there was sculpture in the pediment, and we know something about that. Uh, you can see the columns on either side, and you can see in the second story, and you can barely make them out, but take my word, those are, instead of columns, they are figures of women uh, that we're going to say something about. Uh, and you can see those, again, on both sides. So this gives you a sense of what the temple would have looked like in its heyday. The uh, favored uh, capital, column type and capital of the Romans, the Corinthian, is what is used here. Uh, you can see a, restore, a, uh, a preserved capital and how beautifully rendered they were, very high quality capitals done out of Luna or Carrara marble. Uh, we can see the characteristic triple row of acanthus leaves, the spiral volutes growing out of those, the central flower that we see always in the Corinthian order uh, for uh, the columns that were used for the temple and for most of the side columns on the first story as well. But in some cases, those columns were replaced with others that have, instead of the spiral volutes growing out of the acanthus leaves, pegasi, winged horses. And I show you a detail of one of those pegasi here. Uh, to ha a capital with an animal that replacing the spirals uh, is called a zoomorphic capital, Z-O-O, zoomorphic, Z-O-O-M-O-R-P-H-I-C, zoomorphic capital. Uh, and it's interesting to note that we see similar zoomorphic capitals in Greece uh, a bit earlier uh, than this structure at a gateway that I'm going to show you at a place called Eleusis. We'll return to this when we discuss uh, Roman Greece later in this semester. 
Uh, and these have, instead of pegasi, these have bull protons, the tops of bulls uh, emanating out of the acanthus leaves. But I show it to you to make one point, and that is that it seems very likely that there was some interesting architectural exchange, ideas, architects, and so on, going on between Athens and Rome uh, in the late Republican period, in the time of Julius Caesar, and into the age of Augustus. And it's an issue that we'll return to in the future. We're going to see that Augustus not only builds his marble city in order to make it look like, uh, you know, more like Greece, more like Athens, uh, and to connect his new golden age with the golden age of Periclean Athens, uh, but we see, we see very specific uh, Greek models being used. For example, one of these uh, is a frieze from the Forum of Augustus, the other is a frieze from uh, one of the three temples on the Acropolis in Athens of the 5th century B BC, the so-called Erechtheion, or Erechtheum in the Latinized version. Uh, and one of these is from one, and one of these is from the other. And I just wondered quickly if any of you want to guess which is the Roman one and which is the Greek one that it copies. You can see this alternation of the lotus and palmet leaves uh, here. Any quick thoughts? How many of you think this is the Greek one? How many of you think this is the Greek one? This is the Roman one. This is the Roman one at the top. This is the Greek one down here. The Greek one down here, or more deeply undercut, which is, I think, what throws people, uh, the Roman one from the Forum of Augustus up above. But the important point for us, again, uh, that they are looking back at Greek buildings of the fifth century, and they are copying what they see. Uh, we see here a model of the Forum of Augustus with the Temple of Mars Ultor inside that forum with the uh, embracing exedri uh, or hemicycles on either side. Uh, you can see that the exterior of the structure was quite plain, uh, just in the way that a Domus Italica outside was plain, and it was only when you got inside uh, that you got a real sense of, uh, of, the, um, of the, the glory of the architecture. So I think you can see well here. And most interesting for us, I mentioned that uh, these columns on the temple were Corinthian. The columns on the first story over here were Corinthian. But in the second story, on the left and right sides of the forum, the columns are replaced by figures of women, by figures of maidens. And I show you two of them are survivors. Two of them are well preserved. I show them to you here. These figures of maidens that replace the columns, that support the capitals on top of their heads, uh, and they flank uh, it, this shield in the center with the depiction of a male head. This is the god Jupiter, a certain, a certain uh, guise of the god Jupiter, Jupiter Ammon, uh, as you can see him here. And we have, we have information that tells us that Alexander the Great used to play shields in the uh, in, in, the, in the Parthenon in Athens and elsewhere after great military victories, and it is possible that that sort of thing is being referred to here because we know Augustus, uh, like Pompey before him, uh, had a, a thing for Alexander and liked to associate himself with Alexander. But most important for us is the fact that these maidens have clear precedence in the Greek world. The famous Porch of the Maidens on the Athenian Acropolis, 5th century BC, the Eric Theon, again, E-R-E-C-H-T-E-I-O-N uh, e -E -E in, the, in the Greek version, the Eric Theon uh, of uh, Athens, 5th century BC, same set of maidens. We know that these had fallen into disrepair in the age of Augustus. Augustus visited Athens three times. He did not like seeing these in disrepair, and in fact, he had his own architects replace one of them with a Roman copy. And while they were doing that, they made plaster casts of these maidens. They brought those plaster casts back to Rome, and then in reduced scale, they duplicated them for the, uh, for the uh, Forum of Augustus in Rome. So appropriations from Greece, uh, appropriations in part because Augustus liked them, uh, but also I don't think there's any question that he was trying to draw a relationship between himself, his new golden age, and the golden age of Periclean Athens. We also have evidence for what the pediment, the, the sculpture in the pediment looked like, and I want to turn to that now. This is a uh, relief that dates to a slightly later period that purports to represent the pediment of the Temple of Mars Ultor. 
Uh, and I show it to you here, and we can tell it from this exactly what the sculptural display was all about uh, at, in the pediment of this temple. We see here in the center, not surprisingly, Mars Ultor himself. Mars Ultor depicted with a bare chest. Uh, next to him, to his left, uh, to his right, excuse me, to our left, we see a figure of a woman. Uh, this is Venus, and Venus, as you can see, has a something on her left shoulder. It is a Cupid. Uh, so Venus with Cupid. Uh, Venus, the uh, consort of uh, Mars. And then over here, a personification that we believe depicts Fortuna. Fortuna, the goddess of fortune, who brought fortune to Augustus in his uh, battle. And then over here, uh, a seated figure of Roma with her arms and armor. Keep this figure in your mind, because I'm going to show you another seated Roma very soon. And then over here, a reclining figure of the Tiber River, the Tiber on the river on which Rome was built. <laughs> Over here, a seated figure we believe is Romulus, the founder of Rome on the Palatine Hill, and over here, a reclining personification of the Palatine. So most important that the uh, building honored, of course, Mars Ultor, and that Mars Ultor was depicted in the pediment. There was also a cult statue inside the Temple of Mars, uh, and we believe we know what that looked like as well, because we believe we have a copy of it in a relief uh, from Algiers uh, that is still preserved uh, that depicts <coughs> Mars in the center. Uh, this Mars Ultor again, this time the warlike Mars Ultor, because you can see he's wearing his breastplate and his helmet. His consort Venus is once again by his side. Venus is leaning on a pedestal. She's very seductive. Her, her drapery is falling off her shoulder, as you can see, as she looks toward Mars. And then Cupid down here offering her a sword in a sheath, probably Mars' own uh, sword. Uh, and then over here, a figure that's very controversial, a youthful-looking figure with a bare chest. Uh, and you can see a full cap of hair. Uh, and we think that he is actually the divinized Julius Caesar, very Botoxed compared to what he's rejuvenated, compared to what he looked like uh, in that uh, uh, green diabase portrait that I showed you before. Uh, a very youthful uh, divine Caesar, which shows you what happens to people in Roman times when they were uh, divinized. They were able to shed uh, a fair number of years and were depicted uh, in much younger versions in their divinized state. So this probably a reflection, as you can see the figures stand on bases, and figures that stand on bases in Roman relief sculpture are usually meant to be statues, and we believe that this is, again, a rendition of what that triple uh, set of statues would have looked like inside the temple. To return to the plan quickly, just to make the point that the sculptural program, we're concerned here primarily with architecture, but the sculptural program uh, was very complicated uh, but very interesting, and the figures were very carefully aligned with one another to get the message across. So as you looked at the temple, you would have seen Mars Ultor in the center of the pediment. If you were allowed to walk into the temple, which usually only the priests could do, you would see the cult statue with Mars Ultor in the center there. There was an equestrian statue that was put up of Augustus in 2 BC when he was uh, given the title Pater Patriae, the father of his country. And then all along the colonnades, uh, there would have been statuary, including an image of, uh, of um, uh, Aeneas on this side, Romulus on this side, and the so-called Sumi Weary, the great men of Rome, both Augustus's colleagues and also his rivals uh, in their portraits on either side, a kind of giant picture gallery, uh, a, a giant portrait gallery of, uh, of, the, of, of, of Rome, of the great men of Rome, of the greatest men of Rome, namely Augustus himself, uh, and of his, uh, his ancestry, both divine and mythological, uh, via Aeneas and also Venus. The second marble building that I want to show you today uh, is the famous altar of Augustan peace, the Ara Pacus Augusti, uh, which is one of, if not my most favorite, building and monument in Rome, and one that I've had a personal obsession with my entire scholarly life. I've written a lot on this monument and have a lot of thoughts which have changed significantly over the years about this very uh, important structure. We know about it. Augustus tells us about the altar of Augustan peace himself in his Reis Gestae. 
He tells us on his return, and I'm quoting Augustus here from the RG, uh, on his return to Rome from Spain and Gaul, he had gone to Spain and Gaul, which were the western part of the empire, in order uh, to make some diplomatic treaties. On my return to Rome from Spain and Gaul, after successfully restoring law and order to the provinces, the Senate decided, and this happened in 13 BC, to consecrate the Arapacus Augusti on the Campus Martius, the so-called Field of Mars, an area of Rome, in honor of my return, at which officials, priests, and Vestal Virgins should offer an annual sacrifice. We believe uh, that the monument being referred to here is the one that you see now before you, the Arapacus Augusti, made entirely of Luna or Carrara marble solid Luna or Carrara marble, and even more of a marble building, in a sense, uh, than the temple and forum that we've looked at thus far. Uh, it is a marble building that we believe that we know. Uh, we know its dates quite specifically. We know that it was uh, consecrated on the 4th of July, an easy date to remember for all of us. The 4th of July in 13 BC was when it was consecrated. And it was completed and dedicated on the 30th of January in 9 BC. The 30th of January just happened to be the birthday of Augustus's wife, Livia. No coincidence there. She was obviously lobbying uh, for that. Uh, so on her birthday, 30th of January in 9 BC, this structure is dedicated. Uh, we, we know that uh, it commem it, we, 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 there's a lot of controversy as to exactly what event is referred to on this monument, because we'll see that there is a procession that refers to some historical event. Uh, we will also see that the monument is covered with all kinds of sculptural decoration, including flowering acanthus plants, including mythological and legendary scenes, including historical scenes, and trying to uh, decipher uh, the web of all these and their relationship to one another is fairly complex. Uh, what's important to us as we look at this um, is, and I want to show you here from Ward Perkins, a plan and an axonometric view, which will give us a very good sense of what this altar was all about. Uh, we can see that the altar proper was located in the center of the structure. It's a kind of U-shaped altar, which goes, w goes back to Greek precedence, the most famous U-shaped alt altar of the Hellenistic period. Some of you may know it, the altar of, of, um, of Zeus at Pergamon, the great altar of Zeus at Pergamon, which you see in the uppermost part now in Berlin. Uh, but these U-shaped altars were used in Greece, and you can see that same U-shaped form here used for the altar. The altar proper, where the sacrifice was actually made, is located inside this precinct, which is open to the sky, and most importantly has double doors, a doorway on the eastern side of the monument and a doorway on the western side of the, do the monument. Even though there are two doors, you note that there is only a single staircase on the western side. So the Romans, despite the fact that they've given it a dual focus by putting two doors, uh, they still give it a single focus by a single staircase. So the facadism of Roman uh, architecture reigns supreme, as you can see here. The fact that there were double doorways, very significant, and we try to, we've tried to sort out why that might be. There are two possible precedents or two possible <coughs> references that are being made here. One to a Greek altar, uh, a Greek 5th century BC altar, which shouldn't surprise us since we've seen that Augustus is looking back at the 5th century BC in Greece and mining it for architectural ideas and associations. Uh, we see here what is the uh, it was a, is a restored view of the altar of the twelve gods, or the altar of pity, that was located in the Greek marketplace the Athe in Athens, the Athenian Agora, the marketplace in Athens, 5th century BC. You can see that it consisted of an altar in the center with a precinct wall with double doorways, one on either side here, and with relief sculpture. So it looks like that might well be an important model. Uh, again, and not surprisingly, since it dates to the 5th century. But also important, and I show you an image of it on a Roman coin here, is the so-called Shrine of Janus, the two-headed god, J-A-N-U-S. The Shrine of Janus, which we know was located in the Roman Forum. And tradition had it that when the doors, because it had double doors, one had two sides, because he was a two-headed god. So two sides, both with doors, both with double doors. 
uh, and that when those double doors were closed, it signaled that peace reigned throughout the empire. And we know in the Res Gestae, Augustus tells us that he closed uh, the doors of the shrine of Janus, he brags, three times during his reign. So it is very likely that the double doors uh, on the shrine of Janus are referred to, not surprisingly, in an altar that was put up to peace, to the peace that Augustus brought to Rome through his various military victories and also through his diplomatic conquests, or his diplomatic treaties like the one that he signed in uh, Spain and Gaul. I want to take you quickly through the monument and keep in mind always that it's made out of Luna or Carrara marble to show you some of the, uh, this is not a course in sculpture, so I'm not going to go into the sculpture in any detail, but I want you to be aware of it. Uh, because uh, some of the motifs are important in our understanding also of architecture. We see here two views of the altar. You see these winged lion griffins that are very popular motifs in the Augustan period, as well as the spiraling acanthus plant uh, that was also popular in Augustan times. A figural frieze that represents the Vestal Virgins that were referred to uh, as those who are, are who, um, to which offerings are are be, you know, the, the sacrifice is taking place in part in honor of them. Uh, but we see here a sacrifice itself where the animal victims are being brought in for slaughter. <coughs> we also see if we look at, right, we're, we're now inside the monument, we've looked at the altar proper. If we look at the precinct wall, the inside of the precinct wall, we see that is very well preserved. And we see it is zoned, two, two, essentially two zones, with slats, all done in Carrara marble, slats down below uh, that look like either a wooden wall or perhaps a fence of some sort. Then above, also depicted in Carrara marble, these great garlanded swags uh, that you see hanging from pilasters, uh, but also from the skulls of bulls. I'll show you a detail in a moment where you'll see those skulls better. The skulls of the bulls that have been sacrificed on this altar. And then above the swags, uh, you can see uh, these libation dishes. Uh, and what has been speculated, and I think it's ingenious on the part of the scholars who first came up with this, that what they think is being represented here is actually a copy or a rendition of the wooden, the, the, uh, uh, the temporary wooden altar that would have stood on this site. Because remember, they're consecrating it already in 13 BC, but the structure itself isn't built until 9, and they have to keep offering this annual sacrifice, so they have to offer it somewhere. So the suggestion is they made a makeshift wooden altar that looked like this with actual wooden slats, wooden poles, uh, real garlands, and so on, uh, and that what they've done on the altar is to uh, create a rendition of that on the interior, uh, uh, interior precinct wall of the Arapacus. A detail of these garlands, here you can see the bull skulls or Bucrania extremely well. And I thought you'd be interested to see, and perhaps not surprised, that we can see very close renditions of this also in painting of the time. This painting on the left comes from the House of Livia in Rome. We didn't look at it. We looked at the Villa of Livia at Prima Porta, and we looked at Augustus's house. But when we did that, I told you Livia had her own house across the street from Augustus's. And this painting is from that. It's clearly a second style wall, residual first style, done in paint, projecting columns, garlands hanging from those columns, garlands uh, interlaced with ribbons, just as you see here. And when this was painted, which it was in antiquity, it would have looked very similar uh, to what you see on the other side of the screen. So interesting interrelationships between decoration in, in sculpture uh, and architecture and decoration in paint. The axonometric view again shows you, here's that inner precinct that we've just described, that the outside had a series of panels, square panels, uh, four of them on the short sides, and then uh, or on, on the front sides where the doors are, flanking the doors, and then on the other sides, the north and south, a frieze. And I show you a detail of that frieze, a frieze the subject matter of which is somewhat controversial. I'm not going to go into that here today. Suffice it to say, though, that Augustus uh, senators, magistrates, members of the priesthood, members of the imperial family all take part uh, in these processions that are located on the north and south. 
Those processions rest on these acanthus plants down below, which when you think of it, think of it has absolutely nothing to do with reality, because how could a procession of human figures be supported by, uh, by acanthus plants below? Impossible. And yet it is, you know, some of that fantasy thinking that we saw in third style Roman painting, and I show you, I remind you of a detail of Garden Room Q over here where we saw some of that fanciful third style painting, uh, seems to come into play here. In fact, the, the delicate acanthus leaves absolutely beautifully rendered in the Arapacus. You see the same sort of thing in the black background of the, uh, of the uh, garden room queue. So again, interesting correspondences between painting and architectural decoration. The frieze on the south side has a portrait of Augustus himself. You can see him here veiled, uh, taking part in this procession, as well as members of the imperial family, including children. Here's a little boy in a toga, and here's a little boy who's very controversial in, a, in a, um, some kind of a foreign costume. And I mentioned that I've written a lot on this, and in my, my most recent article on this subject, I talk in particular about these, this, these children in foreign dress as possibly children who were, uh, the, the, were, were what we call um, pledges of empire or hostage guests uh, that belonged, that were children of very important rulers of other parts of the world who were brought to Rome to live with the emperor in his house, in the palace, to be trained with the objective of eventually sending them back to their native lands to serve as rulers. It was Augustus's way of creating a kind of hegemonic empire that he controlled uh, by getting all of these people on his side and then placing those friends of Rome uh, into uh, important positions around the world. And I think that's referred to in these scenes. Again, I'm not going to go in any detail into the mythological scenes, but they are scenes like uh, Roma seated on a pile of arms and armor, just as we saw her in the uh, pediment of the Temple of Mars Ultor. And here a, a scene that seems to have shown Mars uh, overseeing uh, Romulus and Remus being suckled by the she-wolf. So references to Rome's historic and also legendary and mythological past uh, clearly uh, in this monument. Perhaps most interesting to all of us from the point of view of architecture uh, is the original location of this monument in relationship to Augustus's tomb, and also what has been happening there in recent years under the direction of the famous American architect Richard Meyer. I show you a view from Google Earth, an aerial view, showing uh, the mausoleum of Augustus, this large round tomb that we will look at on Thursday, showing a piazza. Uh, around it and showing from the air uh, the Richard Meyer Museum that has been built to enclose the Arapacus. This was not the, uh, right near the Tiber River. This was not the original location of the Arapacus, which was up over here. It ended up beneath a pa palace in the Renaissance period, and at that time some pieces of it were, uh, were, were uh, taken apart and made their way to, to, to museums in Rome, but also to museums as far away as Paris. And it is actually to Mussolini that we can be grateful for bringing all of those pieces back together and reconstructing the Arapacus. Couldn't reconstruct it because that palace is still there now, but reconstructing it right on the Tiber River next to the Mausoleum of Augustus, and then having this whole piazza redesigned as the piazza honoring Augustus, the piazza, piazza Augusto Imperatore honoring Augustus, but also honoring Mussolini, because there's a major inscription to Mussolini, as well as buildings very much in the so-called fascist style. Uh, we see the Meyer building again here. And I show you uh, the, um, the uh, travertine, because Meyer was careful to use at least some travertine in this structure, the travertine base, although this was not his, this actually belongs to an original precinct that was located before, that was done by Mussolini's architect with the entire text of the Reis Gestae. Uh, fortunately, Meyer kept that and, ins and kept that wall as part of his own building. Here you see one of the fascist structures in the area built by Mussolini, and then the famous Alfredo Ristorante. I'm not actually recommending it, but it's well known. There are better restaurants to eat in Rome, uh, but because it has uh, a certain 
um, historical cache, at any rate, I just mentioned to you that it's there. This is the interesting inscription that makes reference to Mussolini, and note the flying victory figure, which we'll see decorates often Roman arches, carrying this bundle of twigs and rods that the Romans, uh, that, that Roman, the Roman bodyguards of the emperor used to carry, the so-called fasces. If you ever wondered where the word fascism comes from, it comes from uh, the Roman fasces. Mussolini's name, you can see part of it here, M-U-S-S-O-L, part of it scratched out uh, after his death uh, and uh, discredit uh, you know, in, the, in, in the, the 30s. And then ultimately, what's been interesting to me is I've watched this inscription and photographed it year after year whenever I'm there. Uh, I've noticed recently that he's having a, something of a revival because they are, and he, ha he is. Uh, Mussolini is having something of a revival in Italy, and um, there's a good deal of interest in him, and they have filled his name part of when they redid the museum, they also refilled in his name, as you can see here. I just wanted to make a point about the sighting of the Arapacus and its relationship to the Mausoleum of Augustus. Remember, it's no longer, it's, it was, its original location, now it's over here right next to the mausoleum in the Tiber. That was not its original location. It was located over here along the ancient Via Flaminia, the street that Augustus took when he returned from Spain and Gaul. It was put up right here. Uh, and uh, it had in front of it an obelisk that was brought from Egypt. And that obelisk was part of a sundial uh, that, would, uh, that was orchestrated carefully enough so that the shadow from the sundial would fall exactly on the center of the Arapacus on Augustus's birthday. That's how carefully orchestrated it was. And the fact that uh, there is an Egyptian obelisk and there's mention in the inscription on that obelisk of the victory over Cleopatra and Antony at the Battle of Actium and that the Arapacus commemorates his diplomatic treaties in the western part of the empire in France and Spain seems to me to be uh, a reference to the fact that Augustus was victorious in all parts of the Roman Empire, the western as well as the eastern part of the empire referenced here, and then close proximity to the mausoleum of Augustus, because we've already talked about the fact that in the minds of the Romans, victory in battle and victory over death were essentially synonymous, both of them referred to here. I'm not implying that this was planned as a complex. The mausoleum, as we'll see on Thursday, dates to 28 to 23. It was built much earlier than the altar of 13 to 9. But I think when they decided to add the Arapacus to this complex, there was a great deal of thought that was given to citing it in relationship to the tomb and to thinking about the whole uh, as a complex, at least at that particular juncture. And I show you two more restored views where you can see the obelisk and the way in which it cast, it served as a sundial, cast a shadow toward the Arapacus. And then there, even though this is a little bit out of focus, the relationship of the very large tomb to the obelisk and ultimately to the Arapacus. So a, an area that was not planned as a complex but grew into one. Uh, a, an image of Mussolini, a wonderful photograph of Mussolini visiting the Arapacus after it was restored and dedicated and placed in uh, a, uh, a complex designed by his architect. And then an image down here of Richard Meyer uh, celebrating uh, the, uh, the, restor the um, cleaning and uh, placement of, of the Arapacas inside the new museum designed by him. And in just a few minutes, I'd like to run through a series of slides because I think a particularly interesting issue for all of us and one that I hope that we will debate in the online forum is the fact that the building by Richard Meyer, this museum, which has been praised and maligned both, uh, this museum is the first modern building that has been put up in the center, the central core of Rome since the time of Mussolini, since Mussolini redesigned the Piazza Augusto Imperatore and added some other buildings uh, to the landscape of Rome. There are other, there are, there are buildings by major architects, including Meyer himself. Meyer built a Jubilee church a few years, a number of years ago, uh, and Renzo Piano and other architects have been working in Rome, but they are not, their buildings are located on the outskirts, in the sort of suburbs of the city and not in the city itself. This is the only new building that has been added to the city. And you can see from this particular view why some people think of it as a kind of white elephant that really doesn't fit the tenor of uh, the, um, the, uh, the city. And in fact, when it first opened in 2006, uh, and I w was there not long after and uh, taking some photographs of some 
uh, pictures of the building that were outside that had been that graffiti had been added to, uh, and there you know they call it the, the Meyer Criminale. And over here, this is my favorite. It says Meglio gli architetti di secoli fa, meaning those architects of the past were a lot better uh, than Meyer is the is the message here. So there are there are many people who do not like this building, and I think a case can be made with regard to the outside. Meyer, there is a nod, you know, to ancient Rome with the travertine wall that is outside and continues inside. But it's typical Meyer white glass and, and a lot of people, I mean, I don't mind that sort of thing, but a lot of people feel that it doesn't, doesn't really suit uh, the environment with the two Baroque churches right across the way and so on and so forth. So I think a case can be made for the exterior, but when you enter into the museum and go pay your fee and then go into the door and into the Arapacus itself, I have to say, and pass the, the marble, the uh, plaster cast of Augustus and his family uh, that you can see lined up against the travertine wall, uh, when you confront the building itself in its new interior, I have to say I, I'm very impressed and very moved uh, by this interior. You've got the sort of egg crate ceiling and these wonderful louvered uh, windows that allow you to see not only Mussolini's fascist buildings next door, but also the mausoleum of Augustus. Uh, that, it, that it really, and the, the light is superb, and it really does give you a chance uh, to see this altar in a way that it hasn't been seen before. And especially at night, I enjoy seeing it at night because as you go by it, they have it lighted up. As you drive by, one of the greatest things to do in Rome, by the way, is late at night when all the traffic has died down, either by car or Vespa or whatever, I just, just get around the city, go from one part of the city to another, which you can zip around late at night. And driving along Lungo Tevere, the street along the Tiber River, and seeing the, um, the altar of the Arapacus Augusti lighted up inside the new Meyer Museum like a jewel in a jewel box, I can't help but think Augustus is smiling uh, somewhere uh, to think that everything he did to try to preserve his memory for posterity has been done and has been helped uh, to a great extent by the great American architect uh, Richard Meyer. Thank you. <laughs>